Welcome back to Machine Translation. Um, today we're going to have a lecture on alternative architectures. We will actually introduce the state-of-the-art neural machine translation model today. It's called the transformer that is based on self-attention. But we'll save that for the very end. And we're first going to spend some time on laying the groundwork on the kind of calculations that are being done in neural machine translation models or other deep learning uh, applications. So we are well prepared to then tackle that uh, much more complex model. So, so far we introduced one translation model, the attentional sequence to sequence model. And uh, it had as a core organizing feature recurrent neural networks. So we used recurrent neural networks to encode the input sentence in an encoder, and we had a recurrent neural network to, in the decoder that produced the output words. Today, we're ultimately going to take a look at uh, other core neural architectures. One is called convolutional neural networks, and the other one is heavily based on attention. But before we get to that, as I said, we're first going to look at various components of neural architecture, and we're actually going to start very simple. So, what are possible components of uh, neural networks? Maybe at this point we should say that neural networks, as they were originally inspired by the brain, um, where you have neurons receiving signals from other neurons, and if the neurons are sufficiently activated, they send signals out. Uh, these were the kind of biological metaphor for feed-forward layers. But we would since then moved to representing neural networks in computation graphs. And there, pretty much any function is possible, as long as it is partially differentiable. So we're not limited by appeals to biologic validity. So maybe at this point, we should really move on from the term neural networks and uh, call them deep learning. And that's kind of what advocates of this term also use, um, obviously, in uh, the current evoke term for machine translation, neural machine translation, the word neural is still in there. So one thing we started out with was the feedforward layer. So this was our most basic classic neural network component and it still is around and pops up here and there all over the place. So this had the idea that we have an input vector x and we multiply it with a matrix, a weight matrix m, and we also add in a bias vector b. The point of the bias vector b is that if we put in an input vector that only consists of zero, 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 then no matter what weight matrix we have, the output is also zero, 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 and maybe we do not, do not want to do that. So we, our bias term allows us to also have different output for a zero, zero, zero vector. Another important part of the feedforward layer is we do not only have this matrix multiplication bias term, but we also have an activation function that is nonlinear. So maybe one annotation we're going to use is feedforward layer and activation function of x means we apply this activation function a to this uh, matrix multiplication plus bias term. So the historic neural network designs had several feedforward layers and named them. One was the input layer that represented the input sim signal. Then we had maybe multiple output layers and uh, hidden layers. And then finally an output layer that represented the output. And that is a pretty powerful tool for a wide range of machine learning problems. Um, one jargon alert, and there will be many of those throughout the lecture. Matrix multiplications are also called affine transforms. So this appeals to the geometric properties that matrix multiplications have. So they rotate things around and they stretch uh, 
but uh, they don't distort inputs any further. So one example, for instance, is if you have points lined up in a straight line in the input, after you do a matrix multiplication, there's still straight lines in the output. There might be shorter lines or longer lines, but they're still straight lines. Okay, let's move on to other interesting things to do. So uh, one is called factored decomposition. So we're still in the space of matrix multiplications. And we're dealing with a problem that we might have very large input and output vectors. So if we have very large input and output vectors, so we have x here and y, input vector, output vector, then the weight matrix has uh, its size, the number of parameters it has, is the product of the size of the input vector and the size of the output vector. But if, if these two numbers are very large, then we might need to reduce the size of the matrix. Maybe you just really don't have enough training example to train that many parameters or that many parameters just do not fit in any kind of conceivable memory. So the idea here is to first reduce the representation into uh, a smaller representation. So how do we do this? So we have here our input x. In this example, it has nine nodes. And then here's our input output y, which in this example has seven nodes. So the matrix here has, uh, so this is nine, this is seven. So this is nine times seven parameters. This is a toy example. So nine and seven are obviously not two large numbers to deal with. So here's now the idea. What if we first uh, take this nine dimensional vector and reduce it to a three dimensional vector? So this required a weight matrix A. Uh, this is now smaller. So this is now nine times three. And then we have another weight matrix B that converts a smaller representation to our desired output vector dimensionality. And uh, so instead of this weight matrix M, we now have two matrices A and B. And this is a pretty good example. We didn't really say much. But if we had really, really large vectors, then this might be a very effective strategy. Uh, and the bottom here is an example of a highly dimensional input vector of size 20,000 and a highly dimensional output vector of 50,000. So if you multiply this up, this would be a a billion parameter matrix. So that may be way too large. So what we might want to do instead is uh, uh, have a intermediate representation that's only 100 dimensional. And then the matrix A is 20,000 times 100. So that's 2 million. And the matrix B is 100 times 50,000. So that's 5 million. And if you add that up together, you get 7 million, which is clearly much, much smaller than 1 billion. And it's not just a matter of size and storing and parameters to train. We also have a harder time to learn generalizations if we do these massive operations. But if you have to, if you force things down to a smaller dimensionality, a model is actually forced to generalize the data. So therefore, this is also sometimes called a bottleneck feature. So the vector has to is forced to capture only the salient features of the input and not just memorize the entire input. We have actually one good example of that in neural machine translation, which are word embeddings. So remember, we deal with maybe a 20,000, maybe 50,000 word input vocabulary and a 50,000 uh, vocabulary output vocabulary. So we do not map these 50,000 dimensional vectors from the input straight to the output. No, but we first do we map this uh, 50,000 dimensional. OK, it's just a one hot vector. But we first map that down to maybe a 500 dimensional, maybe a 1,000 dimensional uh, representation of the input words, uh, which are the word embeddings. OK, so these were just uh, variants of matrix operations let's actually look at even simpler thing at some very, very basic mathematical operations that we might want to do, use in our neural architectures.
So let's start with something simple, um, which is concatenation. So often we have multiple input vectors for a processing step. Um, so there's actually a good example for that in the recurrent neural network, where we have the input word and the previous state, state that both inform uh, the next state. So we have, always do this picture of a state that is informed by the previous state. So we have the state here and the next state. And but we also have input coming in that also informs uh, the state. So we have two inputs coming in and uh, uh, they are combined in a feedforward layer. So one way to write this down is to say, well, you have this one input here, x1, so you're going to multiply that with a mate matrix to produce uh, part of the output vector. And you have another input x2, and we multiply it with a mate matrix. And that gives us the other part of uh, the weight matrix weight output vector and we're just going to add these together also add in a bias term and then all this together gets fed into an activation function another view uh, which is actually identically it's just uh, a different way of framing this problem mathematically is to say we first combine the x1 and x2 we're going to combine the two vectors that come in into a one big vector um, by concatenating these two vectors. So we're just going to attach the bottom vector to the top vector. And then that's what we feed into a pretty straightforward standard feedforward neural network. So we're splitting hairs a bit. Uh, there's not really much difference between these two different ways of writing this down. Um, but concatenation, maybe it's a useful feature generally. And it's something you might want to keep in mind as a possible way of uh, dealing with multiple inputs. OK, let's go even simpler, uh, which is addition. So uh, maybe you have also multiple input vectors that we want to consume, and maybe you just want to add them up. So actually, there's one very, very straightforward and simple way to compute sentence embedding. So you want to have a representation of a sentence. You want to combine the meaning of a sentence in a single vector. And uh, what we have at hand is uh, word embeddings. And so what is the sentence embedding? Well, why don't we just sum up all these word embeddings? So uh, this way, we can take a variable length vector um, that is depending on the, the number of words in the uh, sentence. It's we are going to have a shorter and longer representation for sentences. Now we reduce this down into a fixed size vector that is the same size as the word embeddings. Maybe you also want to weight the words. Um, we actually do this in the attention mechanism. In the attention mechanism, we actually do exactly this calculation, except we also have an attentional weight uh, in here where we then weight each word embedding um, according to a pre-computed pre attention weight. OK, uh, what's next after addition? Multiplication. So this is another elementary mathematical operation. And uh, it's actually a bit more complicated. There are three possible ways we can multiply vectors. So the first one is element-wise multiplication. That is analog to what we just did in addition. So if we have two vectors, so here there are only two dimensional vectors, v1, v2 is our first vector and u1, u2 is our second vector. What we do is we just uh, multiply the first element, so v1 times u1, and then the second vector, so that's v2 times u2. That's one way to do multiplication. Another way to do multiplication is uh, with a dot product. So here we take the two vectors, and uh, we take the transform of one of them, and then that gives us um, again, we multiply v1 plus v1 and u1, but we add to it the other product. So this results in a single number. Um, this is actually used in a simple version for the attention mechanism, and we'll come to that actually in a few slides. There's a third way you could multiply vectors, which is where you do the transform slightly differently. Um, this blows up, in this case, um, a multiplication of two vectors that have two elements into a matrix that has two times two elements. 
this is not really commonly done in uh, new machine neural machine translation models at least i'm not aware of any way where where this is done but uh, because you usually have the opposite problem that we have very rich input and we want to make uh, much more condensed output predictions we don't want to increase uh, the dimensionality of representations okay uh, one other very very basic mathematical function is the maximum so this has kind of similar ideas that we want to reduce the dimensionality of representation um, so in our example of uh, sentence processing it's usually the problem of we have a sequence of words and we want to reduce that down into a fixed size vector so what instead of adding them up why don't we just take the maximum of each element in each of the vectors um, but uh, maybe here's another example that is a bit more plausible um, what if we want to detect if uh, we have an image we want to detect if there's a face in the image so any region of the image might have a positive match for a face so there might be a face just in the top right so if we have uh, detectors for different regions of uh, the image then uh, they might fire on on these different regions and uh, each of them will return yes yes phase no phase or maybe a graded judgment of zero percent phase and twenty percent phase and here maybe ninety percent phase so we really want to go with the maximum value there we want to say okay there's one area where the, our classifier thinks with ninety percent certainty that there's a phase that's what we want to go with um, there's also something called max pooling which reduces um, the dimensionality of a single vector so we have a single vector and we want to reduce it into a smaller vector so we have a very large vector and we want to reduce it into a smaller vector and uh, the idea here is to basically chop it up into blocks here in our um, math notation here we say we're gonna uh, reduce it by breaking it up into blocks of k elements and then uh, take the maximum of the values here so there might be three values here and then they get mapped down into a single value here so we end up here in this example if we actually play this through this is here a 12 dimensional vector so n equals 12 and we have k blocks so there are then only four dimensional output vectors okay um, another one is a um, variant of that is max out um, so this is kind of an application of um, with a max operation to a particular application so here the idea is that we first uh, branch out into multiple feedforward layers so we have one input but and then we first do an operation we have one weight matrix and a bias term and that gives us an output but then we also have another weight matrix and a bias term that gives us a different output think about this as a form of assembling we have two different predictions for that input and then we do maximize element mice maximum so we basically take a uh, look at the output of this first computation so this one vector and the output of this other computation so the other vector and we element wise we check on which which one produces a higher value and that's what we go with Again, this might be some form of feature detector and uh, we, we do a sort of assembling. Um, you know, just one neat mathematical um, take on that is the ReLU activation function actually can be viewed as a max out layer. So we have two calculations. So the first one is as above, made uh, uh, matrix times our input vector plus the bio terms, and the other operation is just always zero. And we're gonna take the max of that. Okay, uh, that was for the very very simple operations. Now let's look at processing sequences and what can be done about that. So so far uh, we encountered recurrent neural networks. So let's quickly uh, review these. So the idea is that we have uh, a state that we propagate over a number of time steps t. 
where the time steps t corresponded to number of input words so we process at each time step another input word so we receive an input word at each turn and then we carry out the following operations where we take the previous uh, state from the previous time step and we consume the current input and uh, apply some kind of function here which might be a feed forward layer plus activation function to produce the next state. Uh, we also had uh, more sophisticated ways of uh, uh, propagating the state. I uh, have a different function here. We had gated recurrent units, we had long short-term memory cells. So this is a pretty good fit for sequences like words in a sentence and it has analogs to humans. Humans also receive input word by word and the most relevant words are more recent so they're closer to the current state but there's one uh, computational problem with that which is we have very long computation chains so a lot of the reason why we had these LSTM and rather sophisticated and complicated uh, pieces here was dealing with vanishing and disappear and vanishing and exploding gradients um, so all these are, are causing various problems and uh, there's also the issue that if you go through a 50 word sentence at the end do you still have any hope that any signal from the first word is maintained okay so what can we do instead so we're going to look at two different things one is convolutional neural networks and the other one is uh, expanding this notion of attention that we already introduced. Let us first look at convolutional neural networks. So these come from image processing and um, here's a fairly nice illustration about how they work. So they always take a region of the image, so here this region of the image, and distill it down into a single point. But you do this for all the regions. So um, let me try to draw this here. So if you have like just the region that is a pixel higher, that's the region just above, this will result in the point just above here. So this reduces the size of the representation, but it has something to do with how big our region is. So, but we're going to do this over various steps, and then each time um, the, the representation is going to get smaller, and maybe in the last step, all we do is take the whole region and just predict one scalar value here. And maybe this is a, a face detector. So this is pretty popular in image processing, where regions of the image are reduced increasingly smaller representations, and... Uh, uh, we have all these overlapping regions. So here is how this might look for language. So in language, um, our input is the sentence. So we have all the words in the sentence lined up here. And the convolutional operations, so first uh, compute embeddings for them or pull out embeddings for them. And, uh, and then the convolutions in this particular illustration always take three neighboring words to predict uh, um, the next level of representation and we do this for a number of times so we end up with one uh, final state that uh, represents the entire sentence meaning. This idea is somewhat appealing uh, when you think about the hierarchical structure of language so um, all linguistic theories of syntax and semantics tend to have this idea of language being recursive as a core element of language. So there's a central part of the sentence, the verb that is kind of the most important thing. And then there are other things that are dependent on that, the subject, the object, and the adjuncts, and they have dependence. And uh, there are also maybe renested relative clauses. And uh, this kind of fits nicely, this hierarchical notion. So maybe there's a verb, um, somewhere here in the middle of a sentence maybe there's a verb somewhere and then there's a noun phrase here so the noun phrase then very nicely gets 
uh, process it in something, and maybe there's a propositional phrase here, and it gets processed nicely, and all this kind of gets then uh, connected up pretty uh, nicely uh, in, in, in a hierarchical structure that leads up to the sentence representation. So this is something that could be possible in these convolutional neural networks. Um, generally, how to compute sentence embeddings is a pretty active research topic, and uh, uh, this is maybe one way to do it. So the key step here is to take a highly dimensional input representation and map them to lower dimensional representations and then have several repetitions of this step. So we had this example of 50 times 50 pixel areas that get mapped into scalar values, or this idea of combining three or more neighboring words into a single vector. So in machine translation, we have the problem that we have the input sentence that we might want to compress into a single vector and then decode this vector into a sentence in the output language. Okay, let's look at the other um, way to deal with sequences, uh, and that is attention. So uh, machine translation is a structured prediction task, meaning that the output is not a single label, but we have to build the output structure, and we have to build it word by word. But whenever we predict uh, the next word, the relevant word for each word prediction might vary. So uh, very intuitively, if you translate, for instance, a particular noun like dog, there is probably um, some one word in the input that really tells it that that word should be dog and not something else. Also, if you actually observe how humans translate, they also pay attention to different parts of the input sentence when they're translating. Uh, there are even more interesting eye tracking studies where we check what people are doing and actually what interesting what people do when they translate a sentence. They don't actually read the entire sentence. They just look at the first words and then start uh, writing out the translation. And then they look at the next word and they keep writing out the translation. So they very clearly pay attention to only part of the sentence while they translate. And this was the motivation for the attention mechanism that we uh, already introduced for recurrent neural networks. So um, here's how we introduced attention and how it was computed. So we said what factors into attention calculation should be the previous state. So where we currently are in the decoder. Um, then uh, the input word embeddings, obviously. This is what we're paying attention to. And then we have a bunch of trainable parameters. And this is how it was set up, uh, where we have the previous state and have a matrix multiplication for that. Uh, then we have the input words. And for each of them, we uh, apply also a matrix multiplication. And then we have a bias term. So that results in a vector that we then apply a 10H to. So this is kind of a straightforward feedforward layer. And uh, now we actually have to condense this down to a single number. And how we do that is we uh, multiply that with a vector. Um, so we can do a dot product there. So this results then into a single value, A, that we then further normalize. But there are also other ways you could compute attention. So uh, the simplest way, in a way, is the one where we just do a dot product. So we take these two vectors, the input word representation and the previous decoder state, and we're just going to directly apply a dot product there. Um, another way to do this is to scale that further. And uh, uh, other ideas that uh, have been proposed was to um, have additional weight matrix in there, and even further, we say, well, why don't you just compute attention over uh, uh, by by over the state and not even uh, factor in the word representation? So these were all ideas that were proposed uh, in a paper by Luong. So they actually demonstrated pretty good results with just using the dot product. So this one has no trainable parameters. Um, it also had some additional changes I'm going to take a look at uh, in a bit. And uh, it's actually 
currently more popular than the Badanao attention model. Here are some other differences between uh, the model that was we originally presented, the Badanao model, and uh, the model proposed by Noah, who explored various other attention mechanisms as well. Um, fundamentally, the attention mechanism is informed in both cases by the encoder state and the previous recurrent state, so that's the same in both models. But the differences are in the way the recurrent state is computed. So in Bada now it's informed by the previous recurrent state, the previous words embedding, and the input context. And in the Luang model, that part here is missing. And another difference is the softmax computation in the Bada now model is informed also by the previous words embedding. And uh, that part is missing in the Luang model. So here's just the uh, math. Um, in this chart, we have the same uh, softmax uh, for attention. So the softmax here means that uh, the attention, scalar attention values that are being computed are then normalized in a way that it's a distribution that adds up over one. Um, the input context is the same, but then here the output word prediction in the Luang model is uh, not dependent on the embedding, only on the previous state and the input context, while in the Badana model it's also conditioned on the previous words embedding. And another difference is that in the, the decoder state propagation is also in the Badana model informed by the input context. So this just illustrates that there, there's some uh, variations how this model could be implemented and uh, uh, various experimentation has been carried out to validate these things. So um, let's have a new idea in attention. And uh, the new idea here is now multi-head attention. So uh, it's a nice evocative phrase. So attention, you're facing your head and looking at something. Uh, let's say if you have multiple heads, then you can look at multiple things. So this adds some redundancy. So instead of having one attention weight, you might have 16 different attention weights. And each is based on their own parameters. So one part of attention can pay attention to one part of the sentence, another part of the sentence attention can pay attention to another part of the sentence. So the idea here is that for each attention head, we compute an association as before between the decoder state um, and uh, the encoder state or the input word representations for each input word. And then uh, this has to be normalized by the softmax that you have a distribution over that. So, um, and then we're going to combine all these attentions that become computed into, uh, we just basically average them out. So uh, you can view multi-head attention as a form of assembling where you have different ways to compute, make these predictions about where attention should be paid. And then that uh, these different um, attention weights can be combined. Um, we can even push this even further by having fine-grained attention. So why not? Why just have a singular value to weight entire vectors? Why don't say, well, a certain attention needs to be paid to the first element of a vector, and a more different kind of attention needs to be paid to the second element of the vector, and so on. So this idea was also proposed. So we still compute attention. Uh, with uh, feedforward neural network or any other variants uh, that we encountered. But then we apply the softmax over each dimension of the vector. So for each of the dimensions, so the output of the calculation here is now not a scalar value for this situation, but a vector. And then we can 
uh, normalize this vector. So each in each uh, for each of the input values, if you consider all the possible input words um, for each of the dimensions, these values have to add up to one. But they can be different from each other. So then uh, the input context is then weighted element-wise with an element-wise uh, multiplication. Okay, finally, a very different take at attention. So, so far the motivation was we need to have an alignment between input words and output words. So when we predict output words, we want to pay attention to some of the input words that are most relevant for output words. So now we introduce this idea of self-attention. So um, when we, let's start talking about this in the encoder. So we have the words in the encoder lined up. And we want to now refine uh, the representations of the input words, still just in the encoder without worrying about what it will be translated to. So the representation of an input word mostly depends on itself, meaning that uh, when we come up with a representation of input word, initially we look up the word embedding, and then when we refine it, yes, we're going to look at the surrounding context, but it mostly depends on itself. So previously did this with a recurrent neural network, which considers left and right context, but of course an important uh, input into the computation of the representation state for an input word was the word at itself. So now the idea is, why don't we use attention mechanism for that as well? Why don't we, when we consider the refinement of the input representation for an input word, why don't we also use an attention mechanism that tells us there are some words in the, in the sentence, in the input sentence, that you should pay also attention to, besides obviously the word that whose representation we refine. So which of the surrounding words are most relevant to refine the representation? So this is what self-attention has to achieve. So the formal definition here, uh, so the idea is we have a sequence of vectors. So now this is a sequence of vectors, one for each input word. We're going to pack them together into a matrix. So the matrix is called big H. Um, and then we're going to compute self-attention in the following way. We um, here take the, uh, the matrix product here. So this is just a series of um, uh, dot products over all the vectors. So this gives us then a relationship between each vector and any other vector in the input sequence. So this is what this here does. Um, uh, we normalize that scalar value that we get for each of the vectors somehow and uh, multiply that again uh, with the uh, input representation. So this is now combines both the attention calculation, which is this part here, and uh, the weighted, um, uh, the weighting over the um, input, which is done here. So the association between each word representation, hj and each other word context where hk is computed by dot product. So this is basically what's happening here. So this results in a vector of raw association values. So this is basically for Again, we're going to do this now over the entire sentence. So for each uh, input word, we now have a vector that says how much we're going to pay attention to all the other words in the sentence. Uh, this is now scaled here by the size of the vector, and then the softmax is applied. So the scaling is just some additional uh, uh, normalization of the scores that come out of that. So this results in a vector of normalized association values used to weight the context vectors, context words. Okay, so um, let's uh, look at it maybe with, uh, basically just showing here the same thing with just slightly different math. So we have um, this context uh, rep input, word rep input word representation hj. And we want to produce an association score between each hj and hk. 
um, each case now transformed, it makes this a dot product and this computes this association st score. It's normalized by the size of that input uh, vector. Then we normalize that with a softmax as we have done previously with this attention calculation. And then we compute the weighted sum. So here's now the, the vector coming in and multiply it with the weight and that gives them and summing up over all the context words. That's self-attention. Okay, so we're introducing that here. Um, later when we discuss the transformer architecture, we're actually going to go into great detail about how that is being used in the transformer. Uh, so the sneak preview here is the transformer architecture replaces the recurrent neural networks with self-attention. So instead of walking through the input sequence word by word, it does the self-attention calculation, which also has speed problems and also shortens computation chains. Okay, so we introduced now a lot of elements that we can now use to rather quickly describe more complicated machine translation models. So all the kind of pieces were already laid out and now we're actually going to look at some architectures that use the kind of um, elements that we introduced in an end-to-end -end neural machine translation model. So the first one is convolutional machine translation. So the interesting thing about this, this is actually the first end-to-end -end neural machine translation model of the modern era that was introduced uh, by Kalchbrenner and Blunson in 2013 and was actually a convolutional neural machine translation model. Um, so they just more, more pretty directly took the lessons that were proposed for computer vision and said, hey, we can apply the same kind of ideas to uh, language processing, and they did that. So um, here's the idea, and this should look familiar. This is basically what we, uh, what we uh, laid out here. So you have the input word embeddings, and then this gets uh, reduced in complexity to uh, through a convolutional layer to a, a more compact representation. There were actually just uh, different si only two layers of convolution before we reach the end here. And uh, they have different sizes depending on the length of the sentence. So a K2 layer combines two words at a time, a K3 layer combines three words at a time. And then here the final one is the L3 layer. And the index here says something about how much, how many states they combine. So what are we going to do with longer sentences? So there are various options. One is to just have different sizes for these. Um, in the model that was proposed uh, by Kalchbrenner and Blunson, uh, it just uh, had more of these. Yeah, now they're not any more sentence representation states. They are now kind of... Uh, part of the sentence representation state. So one thing to maybe draw a bit clearly. So if you have a state like this here, what it really spans over is these words here. So it only actually represents the beginning of a sentence. So it doesn't have a full view of the sentence. So there's no, there's no view of the entire sentence anymore in any of these individual states. And if you see how that is being used to make predictions, that also fans out, but um, up to this point, it doesn't fan out to all the words, but to uh, but it still has an impact on the additional predictions because the decoder has also this here, uh, uh, the sequence of recurrent states. So information is passed on there. So it kind of interestingly has a recurrent neural network in the, in the decoder but not in the encoder. Um, this idea of using convolutional neural networks was picked up uh, a few years later by Gehring et al. in 2017, which uh, used a combination of convolutional neural networks and attention and uh, uh, has sequence-to-sequence -sequence attention mainly as before, but the recurrent neural networks are replaced by convolutional layers. So what does that mean? So this is the encoder, which has various layers of encoding. So this is the refinement of each word 
is done by um, just looking at neighboring words. So in a way, it's quite different from convolution. The original goal of convolution to reduce the dimensionality of the input representation. Here, actually, the dimensionality of the input word representation is not being reduced, but uh, words are, the words are refined by surrounding context. Again, if you look at any of these words, uh, they only look at a certain window over the source. And so this particular word here is not informed by that word here at all. So um, yeah, let's go over the math a little bit. Um, so uh, we start with input word representation. So this is as before, we just have our embedding matrix and we look at for each input word, uh, the embedding. So the xj is a one hot vector, and we're going to pull out the embedding. This is now our uh, zeroth layer representation of the word for the jth word. And then we're going to progress through various layers of uh, convolutions where uh, the representation word j and layer d is informed by, well, just basically the surrounding words. So the previous layers, obviously. And then we're going to start a word j minus k all the way to j plus k. So that's the window. And k is the size of the window that can be used there. OK. Um, so and the f is a feedforward layer with uh, shortcut connections. Um, so that allows us to skip uh, layers as we introduced in shortcuts and highways. And uh, uh, still the final a representation that you have after, even after you go through various layers of this is may only be reform, informed by partial sentence context as we illustrated here that it might not have a full view of uh, the input sentence. Uh, so a nice advantage is that all the words can be processed in parallel so once you go through the layers you can, you can process all the words at the same time this is a huge advantage over recurrent neural networks where you don't have to walk through the entire sentence anymore. So this makes it faster. Not necessarily in the amount of computation you have to do, but uh, if you parallelize things, if you just assume infinite parallelization, you definitely have fewer computation steps you take. So here's now uh, the decoder part of the convolutional neural machine translation model. So you have start with the uh, input context. That is actually uh, computed the same way as, as before, attention over the input encoder state. So we don't really change anything there. But the decoder um, it has now this convolutional aspect to it on conditioning on previous output words. So the way you can look at this here, these are the previous output words that are being produced. Now we're predicting this output word here. And uh, here are the embeddings for the previous output words that correspond. So if you follow this arrow here, this is the directly preceding. This is the, so this is the word minus one, this is the word minus two, this is the word minus three, this is the word minus four, word five, so, and so on. Uh, so instead of having a recurrent state here, we just have a view of, in this case, the seven previous output words. And um, we condense these down with these convolutional layers into a single state. And then for this single state, we're going to make a softmax prediction over output word, uh, about the output word vocabulary that allows us then to predict one output word. Um, the math for here as well. So recall um, that uh, this is how the, uh, uh, the current neural network decoder computed the next state. So it conditioned it on the previous state, uh, optionally the embedding of the previously produced word and the input context. And now we have this here, where we have the, if you want to call it, decoder state uh, that is being conditioned on, you know, k previous words and uh, the input context. <clears throat> 
and this is done via stacked convolutions and here is down here is the math over stacked convolutions where you just have uh, a window over these words and the input context and then this gets reduced in each layer um, a little bit more to uh, more condensed uh, representation so this is still the view over seven and then uh, each layer you go further this window shrinks a bit because uh, these convolutions are applied. Um, yeah, just to wrap this up, uh, the attention mechanism, as I already said, is fundamentally unchanged. You pretty much have the same uh, attention mechanisms where we have uh, uh, the previous state of the convolutional neural network and uh, the input word representations. And uh, uh, just the only thing to keep in mind here is um, the, the encoder state is obviously the last layer of the convolutional neural network and the decoder state is also the finally computed state uh, and the last layer of the decoder. And there's one refinement when computing the context vector CI, so there are shortcut connections between the final layer decoder state and the word embedding that is being used there. Um, these kind of shortcut connections do pop up here and there in these more complex models that have multiple layers, and this is one way to do it here. It's just uh, the final layer of, of feeding in the input word in addition to this refined representation of the input word. Okay, so we are now uh, ready for the grand finale where we talk about the transformer model which is the dominant model, not only for machine translation, but for many other applications in natural language processing. It is basically the underlying technology behind refined word representations like BERT and uh, many other um, uses of natural language applications. Okay, so the key thing here in uh, uh, the transformer model is self-attention. So the research paper that was published that presented the transformer model had the catchy title, attention is all you need. So all you need is the attention mechanism and you don't need uh, recurrent neural networks anymore. So you have self-attention in the encoder. So the word representations are refined now based on relevant words and what relevant words, what the word, which words are relevant is computed by attention over those words. And the same thing in the decoder where you also have multiple layers now where the decoder states are refined by, by basically figuring out which of the previous decoder states are more relevant to make predictions to now predict the next output word. Okay, so there's also regular attention to connect the encoder and the decoder so uh, at some point in the first layer of the encoder uh, of the decoder you obviously have to pay attention to the encoder states as well so this is currently the most successful model and uh, uh, the, the power seems to be mainly coming from self-intention in the encoder and uh, uh, so it's actually a mistake here that should say encoder um, uh, some experiments have shown that you get equally well uh, performance if you have a regular recurrent neural network model in the decoder. More on that actually later. Okay, so here is in all its glory the computations that take place in the encoder. And we're talking here about in the green box, in the big green box, um, just one layer of self-attention. Okay, um, so what's going on here? Um, one interesting refinement here at the input words is we not only have an input word embedding, we also have a position embedding. So we say this is the fourth word. This is kind of interesting because otherwise um, which position things are in is not as completely lost. Attention is computed over input word embeddings but since they're not uh, 
pre computed and processed sequentially in any kind of way, um, you completely lose any kind of sense of all which order the input words are. So the embedding of the position uh, helps with that. So this might, for instance, guide that the surrounding words are more important than other words. Or if a word occurs multiple times in the input sentence, it doesn't get two identical representations. But uh, uh, one representation for the word plus the position, uh, and the position is then different. OK, otherwise, what we have here is our conditional uh, word embeddings for words that uh, uh, besides this uh, input word, uh, additional uh, 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 information is kind of the usual off-the-shelf word embeddings. And now the idea is to combine this with um, uh, self-attention, where we pay attention to the surrounding words. So um, we basically compute self-attention and then compute the weighted sum uh, this is um, as we've done before. Uh, talk a little bit more about the math here. So what do you have here is an add in norm. So this is here a classic shortcut connection as well. And uh, after you have that, so this is just kind of weighted some input context, the same idea as we had attention before. But what's added on top of that then is a, just a generic feedforward layer that kind of refines this representation further, again, with a shortcut connection. OK, let's go with the math. So we already introduced uh, this idea of self-attention earlier, where we say, let's take a look at the input representations for the word Js and just line them all up. And that's going to give us a matrix. And then if I compute the matrix with the transform of the matrix, I basically compute the inner dot product over the words. And this gives us then uh, attention vectors for each word uh, that we, uh, the, the, the values in there uh, get first normalized a little bit by the size of that vector, so the length of the sentence. And uh, the, uh, um, here we, we basically carry out the weighted sum. So in addition to the self-attention calculation, we also add in um, the original vector. So this is the refined representation. And we just add in uh, the original representation so we can also uh, combine the two. So this is a, just a classic shortcut connection. Remember when you first talked about support shortcuts connections where we said y equals f of x plus x. Um, this is basically what happens here. OK, layer normalization um, is what we talked about in the last lecture on um, one of the tricks. Uh, make sure that these values don't get out of whack. So uh, maybe get in general, get too small or too high, so layer normalization takes care of that. Um, and then we have a feedforward neural network where we use here a ReLU, so a rectified linear unit, um, applied as an activation function to uh, just a typical FI transform here. And after that, we just throw in another layer normalization. So layer normalization is a kind of a really good method to make sure that the values don't take on too extreme, uh, get too extreme magnitude. And what also what you see in here is we snuck in here another shortcut connection. So again, this is um, our fx here. And then we add in the x. So the idea is to do this and uh, have actually multiple of those self-attention layers. Um, typical number here is six for some reason. Uh, so we have six layers of the self-attention. You can use any kind of numbers of them. And apparently, the, the more you stack 
the better performance you get, but it also increases computational cost in training time. So the first um, layer in these self attentions for the encoder is just the word embedding, and then we apply the self attention layer here. This is the calculations as we just did it. Uh, so originally, you would think we throw in here just the embeddings for these words. And uh, if that's what happens in the first layer, in the second layer, we, we throw in here the output of the first layer. Okay, here's the decoder. So this is now overly complicated, uh, but it spells out all the calculations that happen in there. So it's a, it's a big picture, uh, there's a lot going on, but uh, maybe the first thing to notice is there's one idea of uh, let's do some self-attention here, and then the idea, okay, but we also want to have regular attention because it's a decoder, you want to pay attention to the input sentence, so we have regular attention here. So self-attention looks exactly like self-attention for the encoder, so these are the down here, the previously produced output words um, that we now refine through these layers. And a, a decoder state, then encoders, then we basically have attention over the encoder states here. And uh, that is the typical attention we do there. And uh, up to here, it looks like uh, just regular attention as we had in all the previous models, except we now do the same tricks that we did for self-attention by having shortcut connections. So this add a norm happens here and uh, an additional refinement layer. Okay, same, otherwise it's these are all the same ideas as in the encoder. So we start this process by um, uh, having the embeddings of the previously produced output words. And that's our initial states. And uh, then we're going to do the self, uh, uh, self attention where we line them up in a uh, line up these ve vectors so they become a matrix. Uh, to multiply the matrix with a transform of the matrix, this gives us then attention for each value to the previous words. And uh, that uh, gets normalized here. Um, I should have set the size of S here. And um, uh, and then we uh, uh, weight this. So this is kind of a weighted sum calculation. So this is self-attention in, in the decoder, which is exactly like self-attention in the encoder. And here is attention in the decoder. So this is now not self-attention, this is regular attention. So now we again compute a dot product. And here is kind of the this using the same kind of uh, math that we used to describe the previous models, where we have here the, the sequence of output words um, that are lined up into a matrix, and here's the sequence of input words that are lined up in a matrix, and we compute all these dot products between them. Um, normalize that first, then apply the softmax, and then this is a weighting over the input words. So um, we now basically have here kind of the same kind of math that we did for self-attention. It's just, but otherwise, it's pretty much the attention mechanism that we that we discussed before. Okay, here is now just uh, the full decoder, and uh, the only reason I'm showing this here is to kind of illustrate how all these pieces fit together. So we have multiple layers of encoders, then we have the last layer of the encoder, and uh, that helps us then to produce, uh, to carry out the decoding, and uh, we have multiple layers of decoders, and this allows us then ultimately to make a prediction for a new word here. Okay, so the full decoder, uh, yeah, this, so there's self attention. And keep in mind there are all these uh, shortcut connections, layer normalization, feed for layer, there's attention, again, the shortcut connection, 
uh, layer normalization and feedforward layers and multiple stacks of these. Um, one interesting thing is that for these models, you can also mix and match them. Um, so we had like an encoder that has multiple layers of either recurrent neural networks or self-attention. And the decoder also might have multiple layers of either recurrent neural networks or self-attention. And uh, it's also possible to have, for instance, a self-attention encoder and then a recurrent neural network decoder. And the last I heard, for instance, from Google, who invented this attentional, um, a self-attentional uh, neural machine translation architecture was that in the production use system, they actually used this as use self-attention in the encoder, but not in the decoder because um, the decoder is, uh, can be done faster this way. Um, they actually also in their research paper had this idea of doing both self-attention and recurrent neural network and then merge them at the end. So that's also possible. Okay, and that's it for today. So this was a, at the end, hopefully not too a complex uh, review of the transformer model because we laid out all the pieces and elements uh, beforehand. So uh, we reached pretty much now uh, the state of the art in terms of architecture for neural networks. And in the next lectures, we look at other things besides the model architecture. So the model architecture in a lot of cases is not gonna be changed anymore. Uh, but we might represent data differently, we organize training differently, and um, uh, look at other aspects of neural machine translation in the next lectures.